morning, everyone, and welcome to the first session of Health Matters. My name is Nora Kane, and I'm the director of the Stanford Health Library. I hope that you'll be able to come by the Health Pavilion today and see what we have from the Health Library, in case you don't know about us. We're one of Stanford Hospital's community um, outreach programs. All of our services are free, and we welcome people to come by and find out about it. But right now, um, I'm just happy to be part of this program. It's a wonderful day here with Health Matters. And uh, we have a wonderful program right now, and we're very happy that you could join us. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Eric Weiss. He is a professor of surgery in the Division of Emergency Medicine at Stanford University School of Medicine and an attending physician in the Stanford University Hospital Emergency Department. He is the medical director of the Stanford University Medical Center Office of Emergency Management, and he has overseen medi disaster medicine and planning at Stanford for the past 23 years. Dr. Weiss is the chairman of the Stanford University Medical Center Bioterrorism and Pandemic Task Force and director of the Stanford University Fellowship in Wilderness Medicine and co-director of the Stanford University Fellowship in Disaster and Emergency Medical Services Medicine. He is the former medical director of the San Mateo County Emergency Medical Services Agency. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Eric Weiss. Thank you, Nora, for such a nice introduction. Hey, welcome. Hey, how you doing, Patricia? So you guys ready to talk about uh, infectious diseases? Yeah. You know, infectious diseases are, in my opinion, and I've been doing disaster medicine for a long time, that's the scariest uh, um, terrorist out there. And nature can be the most beautiful thing, but it could also be the biggest killer. And uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that today and we'll dispel a few myths and talk about a few facts as well. Now, I just wanted to say it's, it's an honor to be speaking today at um, Health Matters. It's a great uh, event. H have you noticed all the stuff going on outside? So um, this year they actually put a slip and slide for the kids. I see a few of them out, out here. I don't know if you've seen this. It's, it's really killer. I just have a video of it. It's right out here on the back hillside. And uh, look at that. <laughs> and uh, don't worry if you miss the pool. We got a team of helicopter uh, personnel outside ready to, uh, to treat you. So um, on the left is a cover of Time Magazine from 2005 when everybody was concerned about what? Avian flu, right? The H5N1 influenza virus. And on the right is a cover of Time Magazine from last year uh, when everybody was worried about Ebola virus. Media coverage of both really has done a disservice to the public, but definitely has facilitated preparedness in communities and emergency departments and medical centers throughout the country. But instead of focusing on the medical literature and the facts related to both of these diseases, especially Ebola, politicians and the media um, even healthcare providers fanned hysteria and frenzy and fear. Uh, the response to Ebola is disappointingly reminiscent of what happened in the early days of HIV epidemic, when uh, uh, individuals living with HIV were shunned and policies were enacted based on fear rather than scientific knowledge. Just to keep this in perspective, in the United States, there were four cases diagnosed of Ebola and there was one fatality, and that's it. Yet, this consumed the news every night. It was 30 minutes on CNN, 30 minutes on Fox. Well, forget Fox, but it was <laughs> constantly in the news cycle. Um, the so-called epidemic in Dallas Right? Distracted from the real raging epidemic in West Africa. And instead of turning attention to the actual viral outbreak and what was needed in West Africa, we were obsessed with whether you could get Ebola from a bowling ball or from riding on the subway in New York City because somebody did that hours before they got sick with the virus. And people remember people were like, we should stop flights coming from West Africa. 
Well, that would stop healthcare um, volunteers from getting to and from the countries and really uh, made no sense. Now, there are several medical centers in the country that are called Ebola or infectious disease biocontainment units, Emory University, which is where I trained, and Nebraska are two. Um, I will tell you from working at Emory and having colleagues there that even though they were publicized as having these well-developed biocontainment units and knew how to take care of an emerging infectious disease such as Ebola, it had a significant impact on their hospitals. Their number of surgical cases and their census dropped significantly, even though they said it didn't, okay? I can tell you it did. Um, healthcare workers that were taking care of the patients with Ebola, even though they were in these you know, very sophisticated biocontainment units, uh, had a difficult time going home to their families. And some of them didn't go home to their families because their children were shunned at school. And some parents wouldn't let their kids go to school if the children of the healthcare workers who were taking care of these patients were at their schools. And we talked about this on conference calls and how distressing it was. So there was a price to pay for being a biocontainment unit. Stanford has a biocontainment unit of its own. We just don't publicize it. And we have uh, quite a well um, equipped and very well practiced team of healthcare providers to take care of any emerging infectious disease. Now, while you're planning for Ebola, some other emerging infectious disease is coming down the pipe. So you have to prepare for university, you know, for universal infectious diseases. This is our um, a simulator where we practice taking care of patients with um, emerging infectious diseases like Ebola. And you can see we have a special isolation room, very sophisticated equipment. But more importantly, we practice this because healthcare workers need to feel comfortable working in these very sophisticated um, personal protective equipment ensembles. They need to be able to do advanced procedures. So we practice this and we have uh, very good policies and procedures in place if a patient should walk in. What happened in Dallas could have happened in any healthcare system in the country. It was really unfortunate. And it just about closed down that hospital in Dallas. They were not prepared, but at that point in time, many hospitals weren't prepared. Now, what's amazing is that every patient that comes into this hospital, as well as hospitals across the country, is asked if they've traveled to West Africa in the last three weeks. Now, they don't get asked if they've been in Saudi Arabia where they have MERS coronavirus, or if they've been in some other part of the world where there's many other types of emerging infectious diseases. So although contagious, Ebola is not nearly as contagious as influenza or measles, both of which are easily transmitted through contact with body fluids. So um, influenza is transmitted through droplets that you can transmit very easily by sneezing or coughing. And with Ebola, you have to come in contact with body secretions, blood most commonly, um, but also diarrhea fluid and vomitus, much harder to get it from tears and, and other sources. Um, so Ebola is kind of similar to HIV, and I think, um, when people really begin to understand it, it will, you know, people, the fear factor will come significantly down. Now, I still worry about influenza, and I worry about pandemic strains of influenza, because when you look at how many people have died in, even in West Africa, right, the death rate is about 10,000. Uh, this, this is just in the United States. Back in the last pandemic we had, remember the swine flu and 2009, the H1N1 pandemic. Well, in the United States alone in one year, there were 61 million cases, 275,000 Americans were hospitalized, and there were 12,500 deaths from influenza. And let me tell you something, this was a mild pandemic in the sense that the H1N1 or swine flu virus was considered a very mild strain of pandemic influenza. And yet, look at the number of people that die from it. And every year, there are up to 30,000 fatalities just from influenza. So it's something to worry about. 
Now, we dodged a bullet back in 2005, but if you look uh, at the last century, there were three pandemics that occurred, and uh, the most deadly, of course, was the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic, which uh, killed 675,000 people in the United States. I have a little, I have prizes up here for people. So, who can tell me why it was called the Spanish flu? Anybody know? You'd think, wouldn't you? Nope. I'll give you a clue. It occurred during World War I for a first aid kit, for your, for your disaster kit. Okay, the reason it was called the Spanish flu is because they were the ones, the Spaniards were the only ones that would admit that they had a lot of cases of influenza. World War I was going on, and even though the Spanish flu started right here in the United States in Kansas and ended up over in Europe on uh, troop ships, and the, and the Americans had tons of cases of influenza. The Germans had a lot of cases of influenza, the French, the Brits, but they all denied it because they didn't want to show weakness. So they said, no, our troops are strong, we're tough, but yet they were dropping like flies. Well, Spain wasn't in the war. They said, well, we don't know what's going on with you guys, but we sure have a lot of flu here in Spain. So they called it Spanish flu. <coughs> you get a kit just for even answering, yeah. even though it was the wrong answer. <laughs> nice. Um, so before uh, 2009, the last flu we had was the Hong Kong flu in 1968, and there were one to four million deaths worldwide and 34,000 U.S. De uh, deaths in the United States. So you need to keep things kind of in perspective. Now, back when 2005, when everybody was worried about the H5N1 avian flu, remember that? There was all kinds of craziness going on. People were, um, they were setting up screeners at airports with these thermometers trying to see if anybody had a fever. And there was a lot of hysteria. So um, I did a segment with, I don't know if he still even does news anymore, Dr. Dean Adele about the H5N1. And um, we were really on top of preparedness because both Stanford and Lucille Packer Children's Hospital have contributed significant funds to emergency management. We're one of the only medical centers to have an office of emergency management. We have uh, five full-time people who, do, who work on business continuity and planning for uh, disasters. So this is a little segment back when the um, avian flu was what everyone was worried ABC about. Movie, Fatal Contact, Remember this movie, Fatal Contact? Scenes of a worldwide pandemic. But as ABC 7's Dr. Dina Dell points out, this is fiction, not fact. So far, this bird flu does not easily infect humans with the flu. You hear? So to put all this in perspective, Dr. Dina Dell has a bird flu fact check. It's a chilling scenario. Millions sick, millions more dying from a relentless pandemic flu. While it is a very scary concept, pandemics are not new. We have about 12,000 international arriving passengers per day into San Francisco airport. SFO is considered to be a gateway to the Far East, a source of a potential major bird flu outbreak. It is also a likely entry point for someone with the bird flu. This is our isolation room. CDC officer Susan Dwyer heads up the quarantine station at SFO. She says every passenger going through customs is visually screened for possible respiratory illness. In the past three months, only three passengers were initially suspected of bird flu symptoms, and of course, all were cleared. None of them were anything remotely close. However, a bird flu fact check questions the effectiveness of visual screening since infected patients can be contagious before showing symptoms. People can be spreading influenza and not feel sick and not have a fever for one to two days. Therefore, screening for that is probably of limited value. Stanford Disaster Preparedness Director Dr. Eric Weiss says the hospital has been preparing for a possible pandemic for several years. If we plan for the worst case scenario, and it doesn't occur like that, we're gonna be better prepared. Our first line of defense for the flu pandemic would be a negative pressure room such as this. 
Initially, patients would be isolated in germ containment rooms, treated with antivirals like Tamiflu, and given a vaccine if it matched the virus. They have plans to add more beds for the sickest and treat others at outpatient centers or at home. He says the movie's image of total chaos is unlikely. I don't think that there's going to be mass chaos. I think that uh, people will learn to adapt. And people can help themselves by simple techniques like hand washing or possibly even wearing masks. No one is sure whether surgical masks will really protect you. They're designed to keep doctors from spreading germs to you during surgery, not to prevent them from inhaling viruses. But it could prevent some spreading of flu droplets from person to person. And perhaps the most important public health message about the bird flu may be don't panic. During the sarin gas attack in Japan in 1995, 12 people died. But 4,000 people jammed the emergency rooms thinking they might be sick. That could happen again. People with every type of virus, every type of cold, are going to be pouring into the emergency department worried that they've contracted the H5N1 flu virus and that they have a high potential to die when all they really have is a cold. At this moment in time... We're going to come back to that concept of uh, the worried well in a minute because that's an important part of our uh, planning. Um, when we get together and plan, okay, we look at what our most likely hazards are in this particular area, our hazard vulnerability analysis. What's the most important one that we worry about every day? What's the most likely disaster to happen in the San Francisco Bay Area? Earthquake. earthquake. Always earthquake. Number two is not a terrorist act, okay, or even a plane crash, which we had not too long ago, but it's emerging infectious diseases because it was pointed out we're the gateway from Asia for many, many passengers coming through not just San Francisco, but Oakland and San Jose, and that's why it is so important. One of the disturbing parts of influenza is that during pandemics, more than half of the people killed are not the elderly or the very, very young, but it's, it's those between the ages of 18 and 40. And it's primarily because they have good immune systems. Now you think a good immune system would be good to fight off the influenza virus. The problem is, is that when you have a novel or new virus like that, the immune system goes crazy. It just basically ramps up so much that it's, it's, it, it tries to kill it with a nuclear weapon. And that causes um, just a cytokine storm in your body, which then leads to um, all the immune cells and fluid building up in the victim's lungs, and they have trouble breathing, and they have to go on ventilators, okay? So when we talk about an epidemic and a pandemic, what we're talking about is an epidemic is an increase in disease above what you would normally expect. Okay, so that could be a local case. For instance, the measles outbreak that we just had was a, can, can be considered an epidemic. Pandemic would be a worldwide case of measles, for instance. This is a very interesting slide because um, this is work that I did with Santa Clara County when I was the EMS medical director. And we looked at the impact of a major pandemic across the county of Santa Clara. Santa Clara has about 1.8, 1.9 million people. In after three weeks, the entire county during a major pandemic would be out of hospital beds and out of ICU beds. It doesn't really speak to healthcare workers because many of them might be sick or some might refuse to come to work because of the potential spread of infectious diseases. We learned from SARS. Remember SARS in Toronto um, in 2003? that hospital spread was the primary accelerator of SARS infection. It accounted for 72% of cases in Toronto and 55% of cases in Taiwan. It eventually forced four hospitals to close and it led to the quarantining of hundreds of healthcare workers. 50% of the cases of SARS were in Toronto were in healthcare workers who were exposed while caring for patients. Okay, so how do you get to a, uh, a pandemic? How does it go from being a, a virus in a bird or a, um, a pig to one in humans? Three conditions must be met for a pandemic to start. You have to have a new or novel virus. It must be able to infect humans and cause serious illness, and it must be able to spread easily and be sustained from one person to another. 
a virus that kills off 80% of its victims is not one that's going to be sustained, right? People are going to die and the virus won't be able to be transmitted. So usually the fatality rate for a pandemic strain of influenza is more like 2 to 5%. And even that, though, when you look at the worldwide population, that's a huge number of uh, fatalities. Now, historically, pigs have been the mixing vessel for the process known as resortment. Uh, where the viruses are created. So think of, um, think of it like this. You've got birds with their virus, but they can't give it to humans, but they can give it to pigs. And then you have humans with their virus. They can't give it to birds, but they can give it to pigs. And then you have pigs that are like the mixing vessel that can get both viruses, and they kind of mix it up inside their cells, and out comes a new virus, that can infect birds and can infect humans. So that's why you, it's not a good scene when you have the uh, sick chickens living right next to the sick pigs. They exchange their virus and out comes a new strain of influenza that can infect humans. Now let's talk about the difference between influenza and a common cold. Who can tell me the difference between a cold and influenza? People with colds can have fevers, right? No? Okay. Well, that's, that's pretty good. That's, that, that's worth a first aid kit, I think. But that's not going to... So if two people show up in the emergency room with fever, how do I know one has the flu and one has the cold? Clinically, I know I can do tests, but there, there are ways to sort it out. So what I'm going to do, you got it? You want it? No, they're both, they're both respiratory illnesses. Let me describe to you somebody with a cold. Somebody with a cold sitting here in this room right now, they're getting a little scratchy, sore throat. Their nose is running. They, you know, kind of congested. They're not feeling 100%, but they're still here. They still came to this conference, right? Or they go to work. The next day, the throat hurts a little bit more. You know, they're gargling with salt water. Take a little Tylenol. They're still going to work. Then their nose is congested. They got a little low-grade cough. Yeah, but they still feel like going to work. Now we're three days into it. Maybe on day four, they say, oh, I should stay home. You know, I'm like really blowing out a lot of stuff from my nose. I'm congested. I'm coughing. Then they go see the doctor, okay? That's over four days. Now, this is influenza. You're sitting here at this talk, and all of a sudden, right now, you just feel like a train hit you, okay? You start getting chills, and you just go, I, I got to get home and find my bed, Okay, influenza comes on suddenly, and it's manifest by going from feeling normal to feeling icky poo in a really fast time frame. People with influenza don't feel like coming to Eric Weiss's lecture. They don't want to go to work. They just want to go to bed. And here's what they complain of, most likely. They complain of fever. Right? They get chills first. The reason you get chills is because the virus is in you and your body says, hey, we have been invaded and we need to get rid of this invader. So let's raise the temperature and get our immune system going better. The immune system works at a higher temperature. So your body sends up these, these kind of hormones to the brain and says, hey, raise the temperature up a little bit, will you? So the thermostat in the brain goes up to 102 degrees Fahrenheit, but your body's sitting there at 98.6. How is your body going to create that elevated temperature? It's going to shiver. And when it shivers, it generates heat, call that muscle activity. And then finally, your thermostat hits 102, your body's at 102. You stop shivering, but you feel awful because you got this fever. So then your mom comes along and says, here, take some ibuprofen or Tylenol. Well, the ibuprofen or Tylenol goes up to the thermostat and says, all right, boys, let's drop that temperature right back down to 98.6.
But now your body's sitting there with 102 temperature. What does your body do? It's going to sweat. Because when you sweat, you dissipate heat. So you wake up at 3 in the morning and your pajamas are all soaked because your temperature came down. Your body tried to bring that temperature down through sweating and evaporative heat loss. All right, so people with influenza get sudden onset of illness. They almost always have a fever. And as you pointed out, many people with cold either have a very low grade fever or none at all. They also get headaches. If you have influenza and you don't have a headache, then you probably have something else. The headache is almost always right behind the eyeballs. Your head hurts and you get muscle aches. People with influenza get muscle aches. People with colds can get muscle aches, but it's not the same. Um, sore throat can be seen in both. Cough is not a differentiating factor. And diarrhea is seen in children, but adults with diarrhea or vomiting don't think influenza, think of something else. This is um, from five different studies that show the most common symptoms in people with influenza are cough, fever, and that prostration means you, are, you just want to go to bed. You don't want to sit here and listen to this talk, okay? Now, there are rapid tests for influenza that you can do. They're not that sensitive, which means if I take 100 people who I know have influenza, and I test them with these rapid tests, about 75 to 80 of them will be positive, sometimes even lower. And it's not that the test is that bad. It's the fact that people don't do a good job of getting specimens. You've got to stick the Q-tip so far up the nose, you're halfway into the brain to get a good swab, and people aren't willing to do that. No, I'm just kidding. So uh, these tests are available, and uh, I'm going to talk about what you should have at home for influenza. Um, the first thing I want to talk a little bit about is the vaccine. How many people here uh, received the flu vaccine? Anybody, uh, does anybody against the flu vaccine? Your brother? Yeah, well, there, there's very few contraindications to the flu vaccine. It can be given to anybody, uh, anybody over six months of age. Now, we don't give flu vaccines to children under six months because it's not effective. Um, but that's why women in their um, third trimester of pregnancy should get the vaccine because that'll protect their infants into their first year of life. And the infants are some of the most susceptible people to, uh, to influenza. Now, how well the flu vaccine works, is not, it's not guaranteed to work. This year, they did a really bad job of trying to figure out what to put in the flu vaccine, right? So the flu vaccine, it takes months to make. So the, these guys and girls, they sit around and go, well, which virus should we go after with the flu vaccine? They said, well, the H1N1, that swine flu, is still circulating pretty heavily in the environment, so that was the big one. And then they chose another virus, and it turned out they were wrong, that the most common virus that actually circulated in 2014 and 2015 was H3N2, but it had changed a little bit. It had changed its genetic makeup just enough so the flu vaccine was not very helpful. In fact, it only worked in about 19% of people. That left, what, 80% of the population vulnerable to influenza even after the vaccine. Now, having said that, it's the best thing we have to prevent influenza, and influenza kills thousands of people every year, so I strongly recommend it. Some people who get a flu vaccine aren't going to respond to it. As you get older, you're less likely to get a good immune response, and um, I have some helpful clues for that. Now, even if you get sick, even if you had the flu vaccine and you get the flu, right, you're still going to be better because you'll have a less significant illness. Children, for instance, who have had the flu vaccine and then get the flu, they have a much, much easier time with it. 75% less hospitalization rate, and that is uh, significant. So, right. So the flu vaccine has multiple strains of in it. It has, so this vaccine, there was two types. There was a trivalent and a quadrivalent, which means they 
went after three viruses or four, depending upon which one you had. Two were influenza A viruses and one was an influenza B virus. So they went after both. They did a good job with influenza B. Unfortunately, they got the wrong influenza A, and that's why the flu vaccine this year uh, did not work. Now, can you get the flu from the flu vaccine? Absolutely not. You can get a little, you can feel a little bad for a day or two. Your immune system's kind of ramping up, maybe making you feel bad, but you can't get influenza. It's, it's not a live virus, okay? And if you don't like shots, there's, there's the flu mist, the spray up the nose. They even have one that is a jet thing that jets it into your skin, so you don't even have to get a shot if you don't like it. And in fact, the, um, the flu uh, mist or the, or the uh, nasal vaccine is recommended for children. It's a little bit more effective. And that's what I give to my kid. I don't really make them go and get a shot. I just use the flu mist. Um, now, other things you can do to prevent flu is to stay home when you're sick. People do not stay home when they're sick especially with other viruses like cold viruses. And there's lots of viruses out there, not just influenza, right? There's the rhinovirus that causes colds. There's RSV, respiratory syncytial virus. There's metanumavirus. You do nothing. It's just, we have this, um, I don't know, this culture that says it's not cool to call in sick. It's not cool to stay home when you're sick. I'm going to go to work anyways, and I'm going to infect everybody around me, okay? And then people sneeze and they cough, okay? How do you cough? How do you sneeze? What do you do? You go, <gasps> well, that's a bad idea, right? Hey, good to meet you. Okay, I put my hand here. I'm just spreading viruses everywhere, okay? And um, more people are learning, you know, to cough into their elbow, or better yet, take a bunch of Kleenex with you and cough into that and throw it away. And then wash your hands, carry hand sanitizers. I think shaking hands makes no sense when there's, um, in the wintertime, when, when viruses are much more ubiquitous. I'm a knuckle guy, you know, I'll give you knuckles. I like that. And um, these hand sanitizers or hand gels work quite effectively. I could sit there and tell you not to put your hand up to your face, but right now there are seven people with their hands up to their face like this, right? They're touching their nose or mouth. And what they're doing is they are taking virus from the surface or wherever and putting it up to their face. And that's what the viruses want. They want to get into your nose and ears and mouth, right? That's how they survive. The best thing you can do is to gargle daily. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, taking care of people at home that are sick. We never do this. So how many people have like a child or a loved one that's home, sick, taking care of them, wear a mask. Of course not. You're not going to wear a mask. That's your son, your daughter or something, right? You're going to cuddle them, you're going to hold them, and you're going to become the next victim of the illness. Do you use separate towels or separate drinks? We should. Would you consider a slep uh, you know, putting your husband or wife in a separate room to sleep when they're sick at night? Most likely not. It's our culture. We don't do that. And the viruses are very happy about that because that's how they get from person to person. Now, if you do get sick, do you need to run to the doctor? Not generally, you don't. People are going to go to their doctors or try to get an appointment. And by the time they get in, if they have influenza, it's going to be too late. And I'm going to explain that to you. What you should have at home is always something to bring the fever down. Even though fever is actually your own immune system ramping up to uh, try and fight off the infection, it makes you feel bad, you get dehydrated, and your immune system will work just as fine without a fever. So bring the fever down with Tylenol or ibuprofen. Antiemetics like Zofran, you should get that from your healthcare provider and keep it home. There's no reason anybody should sit at home and throw up and get dehydrated and lose electrolytes. Imodium is over the counter for diarrhea. All of that can be treated. Oral rehydration salts like Gatorade are important so you don't get dehydrated and antivirals. So in our society, what happens is we get influenza, let's say, okay, we got that sudden onset, chills, fever, cough, headache, okay, and you know, we sit at home for a while and then we call a doctor. And the doctor says, well, come on in, I can see you at five o'clock today, or you go to the emergency room. 
By the time you see the doctor, by the time they prescribe an antiviral like Tamiflu, usually a day has gone by. And then this stuff is not effective. For Tamiflu, the antiviral against influenza to be effective, you need to have it in your pocket. And as soon as you get sick, you need to take it. And then it has its highest potential to work. But unfortunately, most of us don't live like that, right? I do, though. I have it with me all the time. And when I travel, it's right there in my carry-on bag. I don't even check it. If I get sick on the plane, I want my Tamiflu because it doesn't kill viruses. It stops the virus from continuing to produce more viruses, right? So you own all the viruses you have, and that virus takes over your cells and it's replicating as fast as it can, and you want to stop the replication. That's what Tamiflu does. So which, what I'm recommending is, you know, ask your doctor for a prescription for Tamiflu. And he says, why, are you sick? We'll explain to him what I just said. And then if he says, um, you know, I won't, she won't give it to you, and go in there, you know, after you ran like six miles and your temperature's up, wear a bunch of clothing, <laughs> tell him you got the flu. No, I'm kidding. Get the Tamiflu ahead of time, keep it with you, and it's very, very safe. If you get those symptoms of influenza, take it, then go to the doctor and have him, you know, check you out. Yeah. Oh, airborne? Yeah. I can't really comment on that. T Tamiflu is what's called a neuraminidase inhibitor. Relenza is another one, but people don't generally use it. And it interferes with release of viruses from infected host cells. And that's how it works. And even for the flu that was um, the influenza strain that we had this year, the H3N2, that only 19% of vaccines covered, right? That's exactly when you want to have Tamiflu available, all right? And you only have to take it for five days, twice a day. It is a very, uh, very safe drug, very few side effects. At Stanford, what we do during flu season is we have enhanced screening and surveillance. And we put people outside the emergency department to determine who might have an infectious disease. We were talking about this earlier. You know, if you have cancer and you're getting chemotherapy for your cancer, everything works pretty good during the week. You know, you go to the, you have your appointment, you go over to the uh, transfusion center, right? You get seen, you get your um, chemotherapy, and you leave. Life is, you know, this, this place is fantastic like that. What happens sometimes is on weekends, Saturday and Sunday, they're closed, then where do they tell you to go when you spike a fever and you might be immunocompromised, right? You go to the emergency department and you walk into the waiting room and who else is sitting there? I mean, you imagine the horrified people sitting there. Right here is some kid coughing and sneezing with some virus. Over here is somebody throwing up. You got a rule out meningitis right in front of you. I mean, it's like your worst nightmare, right? So we don't want that to happen. So that's why um, when there's a when we're seeing lots of upper respiratory infections, we put a screener outside so that we can segregate those patients. We can isolate the ones with the infectious diseases from those that are there for the heart attacks or the strokes or the cuts or that are there because they're immunocompromised. We also track the number of patients we see every day with influenza-like illness, that's ILI, and we track the percent of emergency department patients that we see. So when we start seeing a spike like this, it's a heads up that there could be an emerging infectious disease. We might be the first place to see it in the country because of San Francisco Airport. So it's something we're always on the lookout for, not just when CNN is reporting on it, okay? Now, every year there are over 120 million emergency department visits in the United States. And there's an estimated 18 to 14 to additional million visits when there's a pandemic. And these will overload emergency departments um, and it's the last place that you really want to be when you're sick with an infectious disease. So how do you deal with that? Well, we came up with a system here at Stanford that became known as the Stanford Drive-Through Medicine Clinic. And it begs the question, 
If you're coming to the emergency department at Stanford, where would you prefer to wait? In here with all these sick people? Or in your car with the radio? Got a nice isolation compartment syndrome, um, um, uh, place to sit? So here it is, folks. This is the first <laughs> drive-through emergency department, okay? It has many advantages and few limitations. See, drive-through hospital. And uh, it works actually quite well. And the thought is, is that it will significantly reduce the number of patients needed to be seen in the main emergency department. It utilizes the patient's car as an isolation compartment. And in essence, the car is a moving exam room, okay, as well as a moving waiting room where you're not exposed to everybody else. Remember after the sarin attack, 4,000 people came to the emergency department worried that they might have uh, been exposed to sarin. The first day the news reported on the swine flu, I'll never forget, it was April 24th. I got a call from Bonnie Maldonado, Chief of Infectious Diseases at Packard and Lucy Tompkins. And they said, Eric, there's a report about to be made public about a new strain of influenza, and it's originated right here in San Diego. Well, it really, really came from Mexico, and it's going to cause hysteria. That day, our emergency department, which normally sees about 180 people a day, saw 400 people. Did any of them have swine flu? Not one. <laughs> but they were worried, and we were overloaded. So may I take your chief complaint? Okay, here's how it works, okay? If you have flu, you go one way, and other problems, you go another. And we have access to um, public safety managed radio broadcast. So we can be broadcasting information to people. As you drive up, you can be listening to information on your radio, because Stanford has its own uh, radio station that we can take over. We actually uh, developed this for the Santa Clara and San Mateo counties, the state, and then um, we developed a program for the CDC. It's really quite, uh, quite um, fun to look at here. It's, um, cars are, are staged, and then they go into an area where uh, people are seen while they're still in their car. Um, we can get people out of their car if we need to, and let me show you how it works. Okay, so you come in with your car, and the first stop, in, we use the parking structure, but in our new hospital that will open up in 2017, we'll actually have a designated place for this, and we'll use it if we need to. So as you come in, you get registered. There's registration staff, and they'll fill out a medical record. There's also translators available for uh, people that uh, need translators. And then you get your vital signs checked. He's checking her temperature and an oxygen sat monitor, okay, check in the blood pressure. Your chart's put on the windshield, and you go then to the next station, okay? So here is the blood pressure being checked and a history being taken from the patient while they're still in their car. And then comes the physical exam. So in this scenario, the physician can examine the patient while they're still in the car. They can also get the patient or child, for instance, out of the car and put them on a bed to get their clothes off if we need to listen to the lungs. Believe it or not, we can do all the testing we need to right at the car side. We can get an x-ray right there by the car, and it reads right out on the machine, and we can get all the lab tests we do in the emergency department called point of care right there. We can even start an IV, give you antiemetics, rehydrate you, and have you go over to a waiting or observation area, okay, and still stay in your car. And then we have a discharging and dispensing area where you can be given your medication if you need to, such as uh, antibiotics. We studied this, and it turned out that we were able to decrease the length of stay of patients by over an hour and a half. Why is that? Because the reason people wait so long in emergency rooms is, is because we can't get patients out once we see them, right? They have to be formally discharged and they're taking up a room or a space. Then we have to write the discharge instructions. The nurse has to go back, the doctor has to go back, then they have to clean the room, then they have to go get a new patient. And put them. 
That takes like sometimes over an hour. Well, you don't have to do that when you have a moving exam room and in a moving waiting room, but the best part of all is that it prevents spread of infectious diseases by enabling what we call social distancing, keeping people apart from each other. And remember, most people do not need to be hospitalized during a pandemic. So this was published in the Annals of Emergency Medicine. And I wanna show you a funny video because we had six or seven news stations down here filming this while we were doing it. And people were showing up from all over the community wanting to be seen, but what we were doing was an exercise. Here. Can you turn the volume up? Scenario, the H1N1 oh. pandemic could flood emergency rooms and medical centers with patients seeking help and keeping the virus from spreading while protecting doctors, nurses, and first responders will be a major challenge. One safeguard may be having patients stay in their car and have the medical team come to them. This is more comfortable. And for me personally, I actually have a camper. And so if I had to wait around a long time, I could just stretch out in the back if I wasn't feeling very well. Vicki is actually feeling fine. She is one of several volunteers who took part in an exercise at Stanford Hospital to test the feasibility of a drive through medical center during a pandemic. Yep. The whole idea is to keep the emergency room open for trauma patients and to keep those with flu-like symptoms isolated in their cars so they can be treated there. I think this will be not only a very viable alternative, but an important important one that hospitals can use all over the country to see large numbers of patients and mitigate the spread of infectious diseases. Lots of fluids uh, and Tylenol or Motrin. Stanford is the first hospital in the country to hold this type of exercise. Dr. Weiss says considering they almost had to use this type of service recently during the H1N1 outbreak, he is confident Stanford will implement it and the patients seem satisfied. I think being able to isolate people into a car is a great idea. In Palo Alto, Katie Hammer, ABC7 News. There is I kid you not, we had about 50 people, families show up in cars wanting to be seen. They thought this was really happening. We had to call the Palo Alto Police Department, Fire Department to like set up roadblocks. It was the craziest thing I ever saw. Okay, I'm, I'm out of time, but I did want to say one thing about the measles outbreak. The uh, California Disneyland measles outbreak was the largest in the state in more than two decades, and it was declared officially over on April 18th. It began in mid-December at Disneyland, theme park and sickened more than 130 people uh, in California and um, 169 people in 20 different states. Um, 17 cases were diagnosed here in the Bay Area and uh, one in five required hospitalization and several patients were quite sick uh, and needy, needed to be on ventilators. So uh, I, don't, I don't take this lightly and um, it's, it's, a, it's a problem that's going to continue because uh, people have not been getting the measles vaccine. I mean, measles was eradicated in the United States uh, back in 2000, and now it's reemerging. It's coming from other countries, but we're seeing it in pockets where uh, parents have decided not to get immunizations for their kids. In Marin County, for instance, 84% of kids are immunized, and in some schools, only 50%. There's legislation right now in... Um, in um, California to uh, take away that option to opt out of the vaccine for uh, religious reasons and, and just because you don't want to, and we'll see um, how that goes. So with that, I'm gonna open it up to questions and uh, anything on any, you can even ask me uh, uh, like um, about um, when it's gonna rain, I'm, I'm okay, yeah. <laughs> Why don't they why don't they do more? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I was asking about the flu vaccine when they determine which strains to go after. Right. Rather than just doing three or four, why don't they do a lot more? So she's, she wants to know why don't they just make a vaccine for like eight strains of, of virus? There's a couple reasons. Number one, and most importantly, is cost. It's quite expensive to produce the vaccine. And for every virus that you add, it adds a whole nother a layer. Also, um, you, you, when, you, when you vaccinate someone, you really can't expose them to too many viruses at the same time or the, whole, uh, the response could be accelerated. So you'll get more side effects and adverse reactions and the immune response may not be as potent. 
So then who, who chooses? Who Choose. picks what vaccines we will vaccinate against? The CDC or? Yeah, so there's a whole committee on immunization uh, um, that does that, made up of infectious disease physicians throughout the country. They get together. It's under the auspices of the CDC, not the World Health Organization. And uh, they look at the uh, prevailing virus and they make a guess on what uh, virus should be covered in the vaccine. And then they subsidize the vaccine makers. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, I just want to ask that why Ebola is so, so difficult to treat and then why um, uh, when I follow the news that, you know, in, in the same family, maybe five or six, you know, were, were sick and got infected, but only one, maybe a child, you know, other family members, you know, uh, remain healthy. So w why is it difficult to treat? Um, it's difficult to treat because we don't have an effective treatment for Ebola virus. Think about our treatment for influenza. It's not that great, Tamiflu. When you take Tamiflu and you've been sick for one day with influenza, it doesn't like suddenly make you better. You may have one less day where you're feeling sick. So instead of being sick for seven days, maybe you're sick for six days. Its largest effect is preventing, potentially preventing significant complications like you know, needing to be in a hospital on a ventilator. So there are new, dr new treatments coming down the pipe to treat Ebola. Uh, they're being tested now and probably will be available in about six months. I can't uh, have a live virus. What is the difference between a, a live virus immunization and whatever else there is? So we don't give, a vi um, we don't give immunizations using live viruses, right? They're attenuated. So if I gave you a live virus, I'd be basically saying, you know, hey, get in that room with that guy with chicken pox if you've never had it and hang out with him. By the way, you know, again, Ebola is, is hard to get. It's harder to get. You know, you have measles. Almost everybody, one family member has it. It's been shown that almost every family member gets it. It is so easy to spread. But with vaccines, they use attenuated viruses. They take a virus and they radiate it and alter it. So it still has its antigenic makeup. So the body still sees it as a measles virus and will create an immune response, but it can't replicate, reproduce, and cause uh, illness in and of itself. There are viruses that are live, but again, they're attenuated, okay? So that means that they, they're not supposed to be able to reproduce. Now, there are cases where somebody has a very bad immune system, and we recommend they don't get it because the virus may still, in very rare cases, be able to replicate. What is parainfluenza? Last year I thought I had the flu and when I, oh, and when I went to the doctor they told me I had parainfluenza instead of the flu. What's yeah, so parainfluenza is another type of virus and it's probably a bad name for it because it's really different than influenza genetically. It's called para because it's like influenza and it causes similar manifestations but not usually near as bad. But some people who get, and parainfluenza was quite ubiquitous this year and so is metanumavirus, different kinds of viruses that cause upper respiratory manifestations like cold, coughs, runny nose, congestion. Much lower percentage of people with parainfluenza end up uh, in the hospital with pneumonia than do people with influenza though. Just had a question on uh, fevers. I think uh, you said that it actually helps your immune system bulk up, but then you also suggested that we uh, then come back with Tylenol and reduce our fever and those kinds of things. Can you expound on that? This is a really good question. And, um, and this is something that um, even when I was in medical school, they, they were discussing this. Like, why do people get a fever? What, what's, what's the fever all about? Where's it coming from? The fever is your body's own mechanism to fight off the infection. So your body, in response to the virus or bacteria, produces what are called endogenous internal pyrogens, heat-producing things, and it's part of your immune system. And they go up to your 
thermostat and they say raise the temperature. Why do they say raise the temperature? People still debate that, but it's part of your immune response. So, assumably, the immune system, it, it sends messages to your immune cells to get out there and go fight off that infection. But even if you don't get a fever, your body still fights off the infection, right? Because remember you, she was saying with a cold, you don't usually get a fever, but you don't have a cold forever. Eventually you get rid of the cold. It's just an exaggerated immune response. And sometimes it's not always a good thing. Because if you get a high fever and you get dehydrated and um, uh, it's not in your best interest. Children who come into the emergency room, the nurse sees them at triage and says they're lethargic. When I see the word lethargic, I'm going, they're going to get a spinal tap to rule out meningitis. But I don't do that. Otherwise, I'd be, tap, I'd be sticking needles in a lot of kids. I say, no, no, no. Give them like a whole bunch of ibuprofen, bring the fever down, and then they look like your kid right there, whoever kids. I mean, they're, they're like playing on the iPads and the computer. They're running around because they feel better. And then I go, all right, now I feel okay. I don't have to do that. So it's, it's complicated, but uh, uh, we... The, the fever is an immune response, but it also um, is one we tend to try to mitigate because it makes you feel so bad and causes dehydration. Um, my question is about Tamiflu. Do you foresee uh, in the future, or hopefully soon f future, that they will have that as an over-counter drug, that uh, people can purchase that without a prescription? Or if so, why? Um, do, do I feel like Tamiflu will be over the counter? No, not anytime soon. And um, the, the reasons are um, um, economics and uh, it's, it's still on, um, it's, it's not generic yet, for instance, so it's still on patent. And um, I just don't uh, see it coming down the pipe. But most physicians um, understand the mechanism of Tamiflu and uh, I think it's, it's really reasonable to ask your physician if they could write you a prescription of Tamiflu and just say, you know, if I get sick, I'll call you. And we can talk on the phone. And if it looks like I'm having manifestations that are classically influenza and we're influenza season and there's influenza in our, in our, um, in our world, then um, you would consider taking it. Especially, you know, we, people think, well, I got the vaccine. I can't get the flu. That's not true. That it was only 19% effective this year. Any other questions? Mm. Yeah. So, what about uh, things that go a little bit under the radar? Um, so, is there websites and things that make tracking easier if we want to track uh, what's, as, you know, these emerging, whatever, or just uh, find out what's going around these days? Because um, last winter I had a para. Pertussis, you know, so these little things are creeping up, and I'm thinking if they could put a website, and uh, if, even if people didn't accurately put it, they they know the symptoms they had, so that that would give some indication. So, is there any way to? Is there a website or way? What, yeah, what it's a have? really good question. The CDC has a website that updates emerging infectious diseases. Pertussis, which is what you're talking about, whooping cough, has been on there uh, uh, repeatedly. Because we're in another phase where there, we're seeing a lot of pertussis um, cases because the pertussis vaccine that you received, you know, a billion years ago is worn off. So we're recommending people get re-immunized with uh, the pertussis, which is part of the DPT, diphtheria, pertussis, and tetanus immunization. So uh, the CDC has a site, and uh, San Mateo has a uh, CALHAN, C-A-L-H-A-N, that you can sign up for. And they post. They'll say they'll they'll send out um, emails whenever there's a um, uh, notification of an emerging infectious disease. Um, I had one question. I was hoping you could address. So, there's obviously been a lot of um, media attention around the, uh, antibiotic resistance. You know, and obviously overuse of antibiotics. Is there any concern with, you know, the use of Tamiflu and overuse of Tamiflu? Considering obviously they're, it's not an antibiotic, but if we have it on hand and, you know, we're expecting, um, I guess, individuals to self-induce that, um, you know, that course of medication, um, if there's any concern about that. Yeah, you got me on that one. That's, that's a really good point and a really good question. Um, any antibiotic or any antiviral, the more you use, the more likelihood there is to become, for it to become, uh, develop resistance. 
So that's why with the Tamiflu, um, you know, don't just take it, but you have it on hand. You communicate with a healthcare provider, and you can almost tell over the phone that somebody has influenza. It's so classic. And then when you combine that with, well, I didn't get immunized, or the immunization's not very effective, and it's a period when we know that we're seeing a high rate of influenza, um, then it, it makes sense. I don't think it would get overused too much because influenza tends to be quite seasonal. And it's about three or four months uh, maximum, usually every year when we're seeing influenza. Like right now, we're seeing almost no influenza. I think we've seen one case maybe in the last uh, two months. So yeah, I mean, right now I wouldn't be taking Tamiflu. I think that's it. Thank you very much, Dr. Weiss. That was a really informative discussion. I hope you all learned as much as I did today. And if you'd like to learn more about how to prepare yourself and your family for an emergency, you can visit the Stanford State of the Art Emergency Communications Vehicle that is out in the Health Pavilion. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.